and thank you so much for being here. It is my pleasure to introduce you to this workshop, which is going to be on how to get the best out of your note-taking manual. Um, please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Virginia Valencia, and I will be your instructor. It is my honor and my joy to introduce this workshop to you. What we want to do today is we want to empower you to get the best out of your note-taking manual. We want to give you the tools for you to take your consecutive interpretation skills to the next level. So first we're going to start with some Zoom logistics. Zoom is the platform that we're meeting in today. Um, I want everybody to take note of this number. You should already have it, but in case you don't, this is our company number. If you have any technical issues, please feel free to call this number and we will be there to help you. And I want you to just become familiar with two basic commands that you're going to need on Zoom. The first one is the chat. So uh, most of you, I think, already located the chat. But basically, if you click anywhere on the screen, you will see that uh, one of the uh, commands that pops up is a talk bubble. And you can use that to ask any questions. This is a very big group. We have well over 100 people. So it creates a lot of technical difficulties if everybody has their audio on. That's why we have muted all of you. If you have any questions, I want you to please use the chat. Let us know which questions you need answered by using the chat. And just bear in mind that at the end, we will have a question and answer session. Well, I'll make sure that all your questions are answered. And then the second command that you're going to uh, use, if you'd like in Zoom, is the gallery view. So for you to use the gallery view, what you're going to do is you're going to place the cursor on your screen. You can click anywhere on your screen. And you'll notice that usually on the upper right-hand corner of your screen, there are four arrows, like an X. Uh, and at the end of each one of these lines is an arrow. You can play around with that command if you want to see full view or if you want to see one of the particular students, you can click on that student. Okay, so let's jump right in. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Virginia Valencia. I'm going to try to do a very brief introduction because we have a lot to cover today. Um, I'm a professional psychologist. A lot of what we're going to be covering today is based on my knowledge of psychology and how your brain works and how we learn. I'm a federally certified court interpreter. I'm also certified or approved, depending on the state, but California, New Jersey, and New York. I have a combined certificate in translation and interpretation from Hunter College. I have been facilita facilitating work workshops for over 10 years. I am a published author of educational materials for interpreters. We have manuals, audio exercises, videos, and and vocabulary study cards. So we're going to cover a few basic logistics. I ask that you be fully, fully present. Um, please try to shut off all the distractions that you have. Try to fully, fully be here because I really want to um, for you to be focused so you can get the most out of this time. I am going to be offering you uh, we want not just information, but actual transformation. So if you're focused and if you're here and if you shut off your phone and if you shut off any distraction, you're going to be able to get the best out of this. What I want to do today is I want to teach you how to fish. I want you to walk out of here knowing exactly how to squeeze the very last drop out of that manual to get the best out of your, um, uh, to get your skills to the next level. And then finally, I want to make sure that everybody can feel free to exchange information here. I don't want us to judge each other. I don't want us to uh, make each other feel uncomfortable. As long as we can feel uh, free to change information, then we'll grow together. So it's kind of like what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. I want that to happen in this class. I want to make sure that at the moment that you hear a question or someone volunteers information, make sure you, that you are supportive and you're respectful to each other. Okay, so let's talk about why we're here. Our main goal today is going to be to get you empowered to get the best out of your manual so you can improve your listening skills, your note-taking skills, your memory, and all of that is going to have the effect of improving your accuracy when you're interpreting in consecutive interpretation. Now, let's look at some scenarios. If you can identify with any of these scenarios or with all of them, then this, cl this class is really going to help you. The first scenario is the person begins to speak you're interpreting consecutively. The person starts talking and they haven't really been talking for that long. And you already think, uh-oh, I'm not going to be able to retain all this information. Now, I'm not talking about those situations where people have talked for a long, long, long time, which is good for you to intervene and for you to take turns and jump in. I'm talking about those circumstances where the person has talked 
a fairly short amount of time, sometimes a very short amount of time, and you're already feeling like, I'm not going to be able to keep up. This is too much. And I'm going to have to stop this person much earlier than I wish I had to. And I, you're constantly having to feel like, I'm sorry to interrupt. So if this has happened to you, these tips are really going to go a long way for you. Okay. The second scenario is the person starts talking. Again, you're interpreting consecutively. You start taking notes. But as you're taking notes, you realize that you start wondering, how do I abbreviate this word? Or do I write this down? Do I not write this down? How do I represent this? Should I use a symbol? Should I use a drawing? And then you realize that your notes begin distracting you from listening. And then at the end, when you're supposed to render, you don't really know what the person said because your notes were really taking the attention away from listening. And let's look at the third scenario. The person starts talking, you start taking notes. Again, this is all in consecutive. You keep taking notes, you're very happy with your notes, you're paying a lot of attention to your notes, you think you got great notes, but when it comes time to reading your notes, you don't really know what your notes meant, okay? And the more you look at your notes, the smaller you feel because you don't know what the heck your notes meant. Okay, so if this has happened to you, we're going to give you some great tips. And today, before we begin, I want us to understand the psychology behind note taking for interpreters. I want us to be very clear on what's going on in your brain when you're taking good notes, and therefore what's going on in your brain when you're not taking good notes. So for that, we're going to jump in very quickly into an exercise regarding phone numbers. I want everybody to have pen and paper ready, and we're going to do a little dictation with phone numbers. But here's the catch. I want you to challenge yourself not to use Arabic numerals. These are the numbers that we usually use, right? These are the numbers that we're all familiar with from zero to nine. So these are the numbers that you would usually use when you're hearing someone give you an address or a phone number. But here for this particular exercise, I want you to challenge yourself to use other alternatives other than the Arabic numerals. So you can use Roman numerals. For example, this would be one, this would be two, this would be nine, this would be 11, this would be 12. So this is one of the alternatives that you are going to have in this exercise, not to use Arabic numerals. Another alternative is to use letters. So for example, one would be an O, two would be TW, and six would be SI. Sometimes you have to use only one letter because for example, um, eight is the only number that starts with an E. So you can just use the letter E. But if you notice, two has a W next to it, a T next to a W, and three has a T next to an H because we don't want to confuse the two with the three. So this is another alternative that you have. Another alternative that you have is to use um, the type of um, stick counting that we uh, see in the movies that prisoners use when they're counting down the time to get out of prison, right? This is another alternative. And finally, little dots. So basically, what I want you to do through this exercise is I want you to not use Arabic numerals. Every time I do this exercise, there's always someone in the group who forgets and use these numbers. Don't use these numbers, okay? You're going to use other alternatives. Try to choose one of the alternatives I said. So here we go. Here's the first exercise. Everybody should have pen and paper ready. The first number goes as follows. One, eight hundred, two, two, seven, one, nine, eight, three. So this is the number that we took down. Oh, I'm sorry. Before I do that, I want everybody to go ahead and take your voice recorder. Everybody should have their voice recorder ready to go. And I want you to get your voice recorder ready to voice record. So I want you to use those notes you just took down. You shouldn't have any Arabic numerals. You could have Roman numerals or other alternatives. And I want you to take your voice recorder. I recommend Quick Voice, but any recording app that you can have will do, or any voice recorder will do. It doesn't have to be a smartphone. And I want you to read your notes out loud into your voice recorder, okay? So I'm going to give everyone time starting now. Okay, everybody should be done. Now I want you to play your voice recorder and I want you to compare it to this number and see how you did. Go ahead, play your voice recorder. Okay. 
Okay, and I want some of you guys to use the chat to let me know how it went. How did you feel? How did it go? Did you have a good experience? Did you have a bad experience? How did it go? Let's see some thumbs up if you did well. Let's see some thumbs down if you didn't do so well. Oh, some people missed the 19. Some people used the letters. And the 1-800 number threw somebody off. Some people did well. Okay, good. We're going to do that again one more time. Again, do not use Arabic numerals, okay? We're going to do that experience one more time. I want you to have your voice recorder ready. You're not going to be using numbers. You're going to try to find other alternatives. Here's the second dictation. Everybody should be taking notes. Ready? Go. Two, one, two. Eight, nine, six. One, four, five, seven. And I want everybody to record that. Use your notes to voice record now. And now we're going to compare that. You're going to listen to your voice recording and you're going to compare it to this number. So I want you guys to use your chat. Let me know how that went. Let me know how you felt. Somebody used letters again. Somebody missed one. Thumbs up. Good job, you guys. OK, now we're going to do the exact same exercise. And I'm actually going to go faster now. But now you're going to use normal numbers, the numbers we're used to, the Arabic numerals. OK, I'm going to go fast. But I know you can keep up. Here we go. First exercise, have pen and paper ready. Here we go. 917-763-0971. Voice record. Now I want you to play your voice recording while you read this number. And I want you to compare it and use the chat to let me know how it went. Go ahead. Better this time, better this time. Great, got it. Okay, good. Missed the last number, perfect, good. Okay, so basically, we're going to do one last one because I think you guys got the hang of it, but we're going to do one last one and I'm going to go really fast. And this time you can use the normal numbers, the Arabic numbers we're used to. I'm going to go really, really fast. So have your voice recorder ready to go and take notes. Here we go. 831-135-6429. Voice record. Okay, now I want you to listen to your voice recording, play your voice recording, and I want you to compare it with this number. And I want you to tell me how it went the second time. Every, somebody says, got it, perfect, thumbs up. Okay, good, much easier. So let's talk about why it was much easier. Why was it much easier using Arabic numerals? And this exercise really helps you to know how important note-taking for interpreters is. First of all, because you can automatically use these symbols. These symbols, these numbers are automatic to you. When I say three, you see the Arabic three. When I say two, you see it in your mind. It comes out of your fingertips. You don't have to think about it. So that's one of the reasons why it's very simple for you to use that, a system of symbols that you're familiar with. 
Same thing happened with techniques. Believe it or not, you have techniques. You're used to grouping phone numbers. You're used to having the one on itself, and then you're used to using the parentheses for the first three. You're used to putting a dash or leaving a space, and then having the other four last digits grouped together. That's a technique that you automatically use. So when you're taking down numbers and you're not using Arabic numbers, you're forcing your brain to say, how do I write this? How do I write that? Do I use a letter? Do I use, how do I do this? And you also don't have, uh, 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 you can't listen and you can't really retain the information because you're too preoccupied with the note taking. So that's why it's so important for you to tackle those two fronts. We're going to talk about how to acquire new note taking habits. It's not about learning the theory. It's about acquiring new habits that pour out of your fingertips that are super automatic to you. For you to acquire good note-taking habits, you're going to tackle two fronts. One are the techniques, and these techniques must become second nature to you. And secondly are the symbols. So when you're taking down notes, you're not even thinking about how do I write this down, how to write that down. It pours out of your fingertips. That's what we want to accomplish. The most important thing to realize about note-taking for consecutive interpretation is that it's not, it's not a substitute for listening. You have to listen in order to understand the meaning of the message. You're not going to be able to not listen. But when you have good note, it actually enhances your listening. When you have good note-taking habits, your notes don't distract you from listening. They enhance your performance. They really enrich your performance and they make you be a much better interpreter. So, good note-taking habits will help you in several ways. First, you keep your cool. I don't know if you noticed when we weren't using the Arabic numbers, you might have felt, oh my God, how do I write this down? Oh my God, what do I do now? Oh my God, what's coming up? Oh my God, when am I going to be able to keep up? When you have a system of techniques and a system of symbols that is automatic to you, you relax. It's like if I'm, if I'm, if I'm spelling something out to you, you know the alphabet. You don't get flustered. If I'm going at a good rhythm, you don't get flustered. That allows you to keep your cool. Once you keep your cool, that elevates your comprehension because you're not preoccupied with your notes. So that allows you to listen. All of this that we're going to learn, all of this that this manual is trying to help you to um, uh, hone, the skills it's trying to help you develop, is for you to be able to chill and elevate your comprehension. Truly, truly listen. You can devote more attention to your listening because your notes are in the bag. This increases your confidence. You feel really good about what you're doing and you don't get flustered. Overall, it increases your accuracy. Just like it increased your accuracy with the phone numbers. You had a set of symbols that you know very well, which are Arabic numbers, and you have a technique of grouping those numbers that comes to your aid and allows you to be much more accurate. And finally, good notes allow you to achieve a smooth rendition. Once you're confident, once your notes have taken you there, the way you deliver the interpretation is much smoother. And then we can be really faithful to the original tone, to the original hesitations, to the original repetitions, which are crucial for any interpreter. So note-taking for interpreters, we're going to refer to it in this uh, course as NTI. We're going to be using the, uh, the acronym NTI. Note-taking for interpreters uh, and the things that you will see in this manual are is not my invention. It's actually uh, two big uh, uh, forefathers of note-taking for interpreters are Jean-François Rosson and Andrew Gillis. Now, they started noticing that uh, interpreters had certain techniques and certain symbols that they weren't necessarily sharing with each other, but that many different interpreters had the same techniques. And they started realizing they wanted to compile, each one has their own separate book, by the way. Uh, it's no taking in consecutive interpretation and no taking for consecutive interpretation. And this is in your manual, in your uh, bibliographical references, in your manual. They realized that interpreters don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's no need to make up your own system because there's already all these established techniques that different interpreters use that we can learn from. So it is really kind of sad that in many interpreting programs, they don't teach interpreters how to take notes in a systematic fashion because these notes will really go a long way in helping you enhance your performance. So I did not make this stuff up. I want you to think of me as this uh, woman standing on the shoulders of these two giants. This is Jean-Francois Rosan, and this is Andrew Gillis, and this is me. And what I did was I read their books 
and I started applying some of their techniques and some of their symbols. But the reason why I decided to write the manual is because at the end of that process, with both books, I still felt like it wasn't automatic to me. Like I understood the techniques, but I wasn't necessarily applying them when I was interpreting. And again, we're going for habits, for automatic habits. So that's why I decided to create this manual. And there's a technological advantage that I have just because of the historical moment that we live in. Back in the day when these two authors published their manuals, we, they didn't have the technology to offer audio exercises. So that's why I decided to create this manual that includes audio exercises. So you can actually do these exercises repeatedly and then we have it pour out of your fingertips in, a, in a, um, an automatic fashion. For those of you who have the manual, I want you to open up to the first page and you'll notice in that first page there's the link. It says the audio exercises can be found in this link. Some of you have the CD, that's great. For those of you who don't, just open up the cover and you'll notice on that, front, in that first page, we'll have the um, link to all the audio exercises. And for those of you who have an older version of the manual that doesn't have the link, you can go ahead and um, get this link, uh, copy this link. I'm gonna share this link with you guys in the chat. So everybody has that link. These are free audio exercises um, for you to use. And there it is. So the advantage of this material is that it allows, it allows you to practice repeatedly. So let's go into the techniques. First of all, let's talk about your steno pad. This six inches by nine inches is the best tool for you to take notes. For interpreters, this is what you should be using. Anything else is really going to be cumbersome. For example, if you are using another type of notepad that doesn't have the rings over here but on the side, sometimes the page turning is not as smooth. The dimensions might not be as smooth or if you use the type of legal pad that doesn't have these uh, rings up here, you turn the page and the page doesn't want to stay back. So all these are things that can be avoided uh, with this six inches by nine inches steno pad, which also has a line in the middle the red line in the middle, and those are your training wheels. I want you to, because in note taking, we're going to look at different techniques, you're going to start writing more vertically. You're going to start distributing your notes on the page in a vertical fashion. And your training wheels is going to be this red middle line. So you're going to try to avoid that middle line. So you're going to be writing and you're going to try not to pass that line. So if we look, for example, this is my real notepad that I actually used today in a deposition. I would have taken down these notes. And then when I finished, I wrote this line. This is what I call the been there, done that line. Okay. So when the person finishes talking, I write a line here. That allows me to know which testimony has already been interpreted and which testimony has not been interpreted yet. And I do urge you to make that line horizontal. Some people like to make a, a diagonal line and then some things might look like they're inside the line or they're beyond the line. So to avoid confusions, just go ahead and write a, a horizontal line as soon as the person stops talking or when you interrupt them, okay? That's what I call the been there, done that line, to not confuse uh, the chunks of speech. And then another technique, which is very simple for you to get the best out of your time, is to only write on the front side of the pages. So you're going to be writing, 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 the person stops talking, you do your line, you interpret, then you begin writing again, respecting this middle line, again, until you finish the whole page. So first you're going to be using the left side of the page, and then when you're finished with a full left side, you begin using the right side of the page. When you're finished with that full page, you're going to flip the page and you're not going to flip over to the back. So again, you use the full page and you flip it and you don't worry about the back. That saves you time because it is much faster for you to do this than for you to do this and then turn and every second counts. It also makes you feel more comfortable knowing you're going to be able to keep up, okay? Um, a question that I get asked very often is, what if I am going to be writing, 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 and I run out of space because the red line is there, but I wanna continue going this way. You're basically going to continue writing next to the red line. And we're going to look into a technique called shifting. Um, and I'm going to explain about that, okay? Um, and then finally, 
there's a technique that I like to use, which is using a rubber band, a medium rubber band. So that allows you to basically put all the pages that have already been used within the rubber band. So even if you close your notepad, you're already ready to go, ready to be on the page to start writing and you don't have to wait. You know, every second can feel like an eternity when you're searching for that page, okay? Now let's talk about in note-taking what we write. Note-taking, the most important thing for you to remember about note-taking as a system is that it's a very flexible system. It's meant to be tailored to your needs. So I don't want you to look at note-taking like a straight jacket. You're actually going to adapt it for whatever works for you. So when you look at the page of an interpreter who's taken notes and has a good note-taking system, you're going to find symbols. Like for example, there's an I here. You're going to find some letters. You're going to find some abbreviations. You're going to find some numbers, full words, okay? So it's a very flexible system. Don't think I can only write down symbols, okay? These are all the things you're going to find on the page. Another important thing to keep in mind about note-taking for interpreters is that you should take very selective notes. The most important lesson that you can learn is what not to write, what to leave out. The only thing we're doing is we're writing down key units of meaning. So I want you to look at this image over here. Let's imagine that the person's speech is all these light bulbs, but there's one light bulb that is lit because it's the most important light bulb. So if we were saying that all of these are words, there was one word out of all these words that I wanted to write down to make sure I didn't forget. In some instances, that might be a verb, okay? In some instances, it might be a noun. Whatever works for you. But if you're writing down things like the and to and on, you are probably not letting your brain fill in the gaps. I want you to think of note-taking as a very selective system in which you choose what you write and you omit a lot of things because your brain is going to fill in those gaps. And if you're paying attention, if you're listening, you will be able to connect the dots, but you don't want to be write down, writing down everything because that'll distract you from listening, okay? How to write, we're going to be writing vertically and diagonally. We're going to go into a, into a technique called verticality and shifting that uh, explains why we write this way. So if you look at this message over here, I, this is a full written out message. And here on the right is the way the notes have been taken down. Okay, let me go back. Okay, I don't want you guys to look at the red left side of the page of the screen. I want you to focus on the right black text. Okay, I'm going to read the whole text, but I want you to follow with your eyes this I'm going to be reading the red text and I want you to follow with your eyes the black text. So eyes over here on the right side of the screen. I went to the store and bought oranges, which were huge, apples, pears, and bananas. Then I went home, I did the laundry, swept, mopped, and washed the dishes. So if you noticed, I is written on the left and then went to the store is written below this and a little bit to the right. And I bought the symbol of purchase, uh, the symbol of dollars is right underneath the store. And then when you're specifying what you bought, you're going further to the right. So anytime you're giving additional information, you're going down and to the right. If you're still staying in the same category, you go down. So I went to the store and I bought, this all happened in the same place, but then you're giving more additional information. You're giving further information. So then you go out to the right. I bought oranges. Then you're giving additional information about the oranges. So you're going further to the right. The oranges were huge. Then I'm continuing to list the things that I bought, apples, pears, and bananas. So all of these things go under the same category. So basically I'm shifting to the right every time there's additional information. I'm shifting to further to the right if there's even more detailed information. Notice what happens when there is a new idea. Then I went home, then goes back out to the left. And it goes back out to the left to indicate that this is a new idea that is not related to anything that happened at the store. Then I went home, at home, I did the laundry, swept, mopped, and did the dishes, okay? So shifting allows us to be able to know how the message fits together, okay? Notice, for example, that went to the, 
those three words were not written down anywhere. It just says I and store, and you should be able to fill in those gaps. Notice also that a lot of words are abbreviated. A lot of words, for example, dishes, mop, swept, laundry. Trust your brain that if you write the first few letters and maybe some consonants, you can take, you can um, eliminate the vowels and you will be able to have the full picture in your head. So basically, the technique of verticality and shifting is there to help you know how the message is weaved together. Now, I do want to um, share with you guys the original way that um, Rosanne and Gillis had suggested um, that this work. So let me just go to my blackboard. Okay, so originally Jean-Francois Rosan and Andrew Gillis had suggested that interpreters divide up their page in subject, verb, and object, okay? So basically it would be something like this. I went to the store, okay? And I bought oranges, apples, and pears, okay? So what they're suggesting is that you divide up your page into these three categories. Now, I don't like that method because I feel like my brain is already busy when I'm listening and I don't wanna have to, on top of that, be thinking, what is the subject? What is the verb? What is the object? It's too much. There's already too much going on, cognitively speaking, too much going on when I'm interpreting for me to also worry about these grammatical categories. So. What I have decided to do is basically do shifting. I went to the store and I bought, let's change the message a little bit. I bought a car, a toy for my son. And uh, I bought a suitcase and the suitcase was beautiful. And then I went to the bank and I took out some money, okay? So by shifting, I don't have to worry about subject, verb, and object. All I'm worried about is if I'm giving additional information, I go further right. If I'm giving no information, I go back out left. If I'm talking about the same category, I go vertical. So again, I went to the store and I bought a car a toy for my son. I did not write for my son, but I remembered. I bought a suitcase right underneath the car, which was beautiful. Then I went to the bank and I took out some money. Okay. This is verticality and shifting. So a lot of times it's going to start looking diagonal. That's going to, going to allow you to weave the message back together. That's going to allow you to know how the message should be connected again when you render it fully, because your notes should be dots and you're connecting the dots. Okay. One of the most important things is to know how your notes work, relate to each other. Somebody's asking, why is a toy on the right side of the car? Because the car, I was giving additional information. It was a toy for my son. I bought a car, which was a toy for my son. So the car is the information I'm giving, and I'm giving additional information about that car. This is a toy for my son, so I go to the right. Then another thing I bought was a suitcase. It's in the same category as the car that I bought. And then I'm giving additional information, which is, it was beautiful, okay? If I had kept talking about the suitcase and I had said, the suitcase was beautiful and expensive and green, I would keep going out to the right because I'm giving additional information about that suitcase, okay? If I'm saying, and I also bought a uh, cereal, then I would go down here. So this allows me to know when I'm looking at my notes, what is, are the main ideas and what are the supporting ideas? When am I offering additional information about something and when am I uh, going on to a new idea? Some of the most important thing when it comes to our notes is knowing how to read them, how to weave them coherently again, okay? So that's the technique of uh, verticality and shifting, okay? Now, verticality, one of the advantages it offers is that it allows you to quickly skim your previously written notes. And this is going to come in handy for other techniques that we're going to look into. It allows you to apply many note-taking techniques. We're going to look at the recall line and the shifting. And it allows you, most importantly, to know which ideas belong together. Sometimes you have all the elements there, but you don't know quite how to weave it together. Shifting and verticality lets you do that. So again, 
you're thinking of hierarchical values, meaning what are the main ideas and the supporting ideas and then even more supporting ideas, and shifting to the left and to the right to differentiate these main ideas from supporting ideas. Now, for you to practice this, because this is all theory and we don't want it to be theory, we want it to be automatic, the pages that you would, the dictations that you would be looking at would be dictations one to three, and that's on page 17 and 18. I don't want you to get scared when you do these dictations because you're not going to hear at the beginning real words and real messages. You're going to hear things like shapes and letters and numbers. It's going to sound something like triangle, triangles are seven and four and commas are big and Florida is small, things like that. The reason why I created those dictations like that is because at this point, I don't want you worried about symbols. I don't want you to be worried about abbreviations. I just want you concentrating on the shifting. If it's an idea, you put it down to the, a new idea to, out to the left, supporting ideas to the right, further information to the right, same category, just go down and come back out to the left when a new idea comes up. And you don't have to be rigid with it. As long as you don't go back out to the left, you know that it's not a new idea. Okay, so don't be, don't feel, don't feel like you're constrained. Oh my God, does this go to the right? Does this go to the left? Does this go down? As long as you don't come back out to the left, you shouldn't be confused. You should know that you're giving further information. Okay. So let's talk about the method to study. Um, I created this manual with the purpose of you guys having a method. Why have a method? Because you can get the most out of your study sessions. So this is the, what I want you to follow. Um, if you guys want to take a screenshot of this, we are recording this so you can look at it again, but if you want to take a screenshot or a photo of this, this is the basic Coca-Cola formula for this manual. Um, this is how you're going to do all the dictations, okay? First, you're going to listen to the track. Every time you look at an exercise, it has a corresponding audio track with that link I shared with you guys. And as you listen to the track, you're going to be taking notes, trying to apply everything you've learned so far. It should be cumulative. So if you've already covered two techniques, you should be applying those two techniques. If you're on the fourth technique, you should be applying everything you've seen before that, okay? So you're going to be listening and you're taking notes. Secondly, when you're finished with that exercise, you're going to read your notes out loud into a voice recorder. That's the second step. Okay, you're going to read your notes and make sure you record them and that allows you to listen to yourself and that is a very important step for you to evaluate your progress. Okay, when you listen to your recording, then you compare it to the typed out text. Okay, so again, first thing is you're listening and you're taking notes. Secondly, you're reading your notes and you're voice recording them reading them out loud into a voice recorder. And finally, you're listening to the notes, you, to the recording you created and you're comparing it to the original text. That's how you know if you got it right or wrong, okay? Another important thing is to repeat each exercise many times until you feel very comfortable with it. Don't worry if you start learning the content of the exercise and memorizing it and learning it by heart. The fact that you are doing this exercise repeatedly and your brain doesn't have to worry about what information is coming up next because you know the information lets you focus on the particular technique or the particular symbol that you want to drill. Remember, repetition is what creates automatic habits. So do the same exercise over and over and over again until you feel it pours out of your fingers, okay? The next idea that I want to share with you, another technique, is connectors, connectors and links. So there are certain words that we use in all languages, which uh, basically have the purpose of connecting ideas together. Some of these words are, for example, furthermore, um, I want you guys to please use the chat and tell me which other words you can think of that are connectors or links. Which words do you often hear people using in court, for example, sin embargo in Spanish, however, but, besides, in addition, very good, you guys. These are all connectors. So, therefore, very good. Good job, you guys. Notwithstanding, according to, good job. You guys are sharp. So, whenever you hear a word like this that is connecting ideas together and it's telling you that a new idea is coming up, I want you to jot it out to the left. Okay, when somebody says something like, for example, I'm supposed to eat vegetables and fruit, but I only want to eat hamburgers and hot dogs. Okay, that but is telling me that there's something new coming along. Okay, or for example, um, I'm in love with my husband. He's a wonderful man. He is very good to me. Uh, we've been together for a long time. However, I suspect he's cheating on me. 
Okay, that, however, is telling me something new is coming along. So anytime we hear a word like this that tells us something new is coming along, we jot it back out to the left. And it's going to be an indication that we're going to go back out to the left and start the whole process again, which is going to hopefully give us that diagonal layout. Not all words that sound like connectors are connectors in the sense of announcing a new idea. Okay, some words don't have that that strength. For example, if I am saying something like um, my doctor has told me to have vegetables, but I'm allergic to them uh, and fruit and exercise that but I'm allergic is not really announcing anything new. It's complementing what I'm already saying. Okay, so I like to tell my students that not everybody is a JLo but not everybody is a Kim Kardashian but so you have to kind of select which ones am I going to be uh, writing out to the left so let, let's take a look at this at this particular um, message again I'm going to be reading the red I want everybody's eyes over here on the right I love pizza pasta and cheese however my doctor has told me to stay away from these fatty foods additionally I have to eat mostly fruits and vegetables so here we had examples of two different connectors, two different links that announced a new uh, direction of the speech, okay? First was the word however, and secondly was the word additionally. So let's go through it again. I love pizza. Again, we're writing as few letters as possible so we can keep up. Pasta and cheese. However, we came back out to the left and however became H-E, the letter, the, the least amount of letters, but the better. However, my doctor has told me, quotation marks were told me, to stay away, just uh, this arrow, uh, to end it arrow, from fatty foods. Additionally, all I needed to prompt my memory was a plus sign. Additionally, I have, this is a mathematical sign, an E facing in the opposite direction is a mathematical sign. Oops. However, I have to eat, this is my lips, this is my Picasso version of lips. Uh, mostly fruits and vegetables. So again, the two links, the two connectors here were however and additionally, and we jotted them out to the left to make sure that we knew that we were weaving in a new idea together. So to sum it up, connectors and links are things that you jot down to the left to mark the, the fact that a new idea is coming out in the speech. And then when you read it together, you can weave it together coherently, okay? How do you become, how does this become automatic? Through dictations four through eight on pages 19 to 21. Okay, so you do the, you do the same thing we already talked about. You play the audio, you take notes while you listen, then you render your notes onto the voice recorder, and then you hear what you recorded comparing it to the text. When you compare what you recorded, when you listen to what you recorded and while you read the text, you're going to be able to spot if you made any mistakes. And that's when you learn. So don't skip that last step. And again, you do these exercises until you feel comfortable with them repeatedly. Now we're going to talk about the recall line. The recall line is a great way to save time because it allows you to refer to previously written notes to save time. It allows you to not have to write things down again. So for example, in this message that I have here, I bought meat. I want everybody's eyes over here while I'm reading this over here. I bought meat, rice, which was rice aroni, and vegetables. Then I went home and cooked the rice aroni, which my wife loves. So if you notice, the recall line allows me not to have to write down rice aroni again. The recall line allows me to save all of that because I already have that available on that same page. So all I'm doing is I'm dragging, I'm making a line that I'm dragging down to where I need it. The most important thing about the recall line is where it begins and where it ends, okay? So, we have a question. Let me, make, let me get this clear out of here. Okay, question. Um, do you take notes in English with Spanish speaker or do you come up with a different... Do I take questions in English when somebody's speaking Spanish or do I take questions in, 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 in the same language? Um, okay. Yes, that's an excellent question. Now, um, I tend to, I notice in myself that I tend to take notes um, in the opposite language, in the target language. That's just how my brain works. 
it just happens naturally. If I'm listening to somebody speaking and they're speaking Spanish, I notice that the words and the abbreviations are going to be in English. That's just, again, what happens naturally. I don't set out to do that. Of course, a lot of them are symbols. So symbols don't have a language. The same symbol will be for casa and for house. So in that sense, they're uh, unilingual, but um, I don't want you to feel like, again, you have a straight jacket, that you have to take your notes down in English, or you have to take your notes down in Japanese, or you have to use the source language, or you have to use the target language. Your notes are there to serve you. So if you notice that your natural tendency is to take notes in the same language as the uh, speaker is uttering, that's how you do it. If you notice that your natural tendency is to use the target language to take notes, that's fine. I do notice that my, again, natural tendency is to use the target language with the exception of when I'm stuck with what to do about uh, an interpretation. So for example, let's say that I'm taking notes, the person speaking Spanish, I'm taking notes mm, with symbols and doodles and uh, uh, abbreviations, but most abbreviations and words are in English, okay? The person says something, an expression that I don't quite know what to do with, I tend to write that down in the source language. I don't say, okay, I'm going to wait until my brain realizes what to do with that, and then I'm going to take notes. No. If I don't know what to do with that information, I'll go into the source language, and I'll write down whatever the person said. And funny enough, our brains are so miraculous. Once you, it's time to read your notes, often what happens is your brain has worked on that. It's been marinating on that expression. I don't know if you've noticed this phenomenon. And by the time it's time to read that, you already know how to solve that but you took it down in the source language because you didn't know how to do it in the target language. So again, don't force yourself. If your natural tendency is to work with the source language, with the same language that people are speaking, go ahead and take your notes down in the same language. If your natural tendency is to write your notes in the target language, go ahead and do that. Just a tip, if you're like me and you write down your notes in the target language, Always remember that if you don't quite know what to do with something, leave it in the original language and your mind will have worked on it by the time you get there. Okay. Does that answer your question? Okay, great. Now, I want to talk about the recall line because the recall line is so, so useful. So let's say, for example, that this is the way our page is laid out. Remember, we're using our beautiful steno pad and this is that line in the middle. And the person said something like, I love sports, basketball, and football, and tennis, uh, but um, my doctor said that tennis can hurt my back. Okay, so here, we already wrote, wrote down tennis. In this case, this is not such a good example because, hey, if I'm going to write down a T, it doesn't take that long, okay? So actually, Virginia gave you guys a terrible example, so let's, let's do something else with that. Let's imagine the person said, I love sports, basketball, football, and tennis. Um, and where's my writer? Here we go. Um, and I adore um, Vanessa Williams. Is that her name again? Yeah. Okay. I love Vanessa Williams. Okay. But my doctor told me that uh, tennis can hurt my back. And um, Vanessa Williams has terrible back problems. Okay, so I already wrote down Vanessa Williams, and that's something that takes a while to write. I want to take advantage of the fact that that's already written. It doesn't have to be on the same side of the page, okay? Oh, Venus Williams, okay. <laughs> that shows you how much I know about tennis and sports. Okay, but I'm not going to write this down again because I have the recall line. Again, the most important thing with a recall line is where it begins and where it ends. Because if I don't pay attention to where it begins, I might write it down. I might not know what I'm, what I'm trying to remember. So again, here, for example, I'm saying I love sports, basketball, football, and tennis. And I adore Vanessa Williams because, but my doctor told me that tennis can hurt my back. 
and uh, Vanessa Williams has uh, uh, ho uh, horrible back problems, okay? If I don't make this line clear here, if I don't make this line clear that it's beginning here, again, from Venus, sorry, um, I won't know if I'm trying to remember tennis, if I'm trying to recall tennis, or if I'm trying to recall Williams. But if my line is clearly starting here, I'm not going to get confused of what I'm trying to recall. The same thing where the line ends. If my line ends in a way, let's say my line didn't end here, but ended here, I don't really know. It's supposed to be go after terrible, or is it supposed to go, okay? So when, you're drawing, when you are uh, drawing your recall line, don't worry about arrows. Just worry about where your line begins and where your line ends. Where your line begins is what you're trying to remember. You don't have to write it down again. Where your line ends is where it's going to go, where it's going to be inserted. Sometimes you're going to want to draw a circle if there's a lot of things that you want to remember, sometimes people say things like this. Let me erase all of this. Sometimes people say, I did not see him. I did not see her. I did not see them. Okay? So in this case, I'm trying to remember these two things. I did not see. So if I draw one single line and I don't do a circle, I'm not really remembering what it was that I was supposed to recall. So again, I did not see him. This is a symbol for the male. I did not see her. So I'm not draw writing this again. All I'm doing is I'm doing a circle around what I need to recall and I'm bringing the line down. I did not see her and I did not see them. Okay? So it can be a line or it can be a circle if you have several things that you want to group to remember. Okay? Some pe somebody's saying they can't see the bottom of the page. Try to go full screen, okay? That should take care of it. Okay, so that's the recall line, okay? That's your recall line. Let's go back to the presentation. Again, this is the theory, and we don't want it to be theory. We want it to be coming out of your fingertips. So to practice the recall lines, you can do dictations 9, 10, and 11, and that's found on pages 21 to 22, okay? Let's now talk about verb tenses. Verb tenses are very important for you to remember where things go. Uh, I'm sorry, wh what, what um, tenses people use when they spoke, okay? So to write down verb tenses, you can use an arrow, for example, to remember that it's the past or the future. Let's look at this message. Again, everybody's eyes, I want you here on the right. I'm going to read the message on the left. So here we go. I needed to see bathrooms. I'm sorry, let me repeat that. I needed to see the bathrooms, the bedrooms, the kitchen, which is very important, and the living room, so I could get an idea of the market. I will buy a house by January of next year. So in this case, we have I needed, okay? I needed to see. So I drew a little arrow pointing to the back to show me that this is not future, this is past, and just an N for needed. And then next year, the arrow going forward, okay? So when you're noting verb tenses, you want to be able to refresh yourself on what the person said. And there's many ways to go about that. One is a straight arrow. An arrow to the left says means past. An arrow to the right means future. And an undulating arrow is ing, okay? Another way to go about it, another method, is curved lines, and I'm going to show you on the blackboard. Another way is intersecting lines. Another way is our dots. And um, you can also weave lines to the left and to the right, and you can also use endings of words. So, so let's look at that on the board so we can take, have a better idea of how that works. And there's many ways to skin a cat. So let's look at the different options. Okay, so let's say that we're using this as C, okay? Method number one, this is saw, and this is will see. This is the first method that we have, okay? Now let's go to the second method that we have. We can use a curved arrow just because Curved arrow is only used for verb tenses, and it won't confuse me when I'm using arrows, for example, for the verb to go or to arrive or to uh, get there. You might use an arrow to say that. So 
an, a curved arrow, the beauty of a curved arrow underneath the symbol is that it tells you it's only indicating verb tenses. Don't confuse it with arrows that you're using to indicate movement, okay? So the second method is curved arrows, all right? Now let's look at the third me method. The third method is intersecting lines. I'm not too crazy about this method. Oh, let's change colors. I'm not too crazy about this method, but don't shoot, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just showing you the different options here. This is the other method. People use intersecting lines. So this is my I. Wait, I always get confused because this confuses me. Okay, let me erase that. Okay, so this is my line. This would be the past. This would be saw. And this will be will see. Okay, so again, um, intersecting lines, and it depends if the line, if the horizontal line is ending, open ended on the right or on the left. To me, it's confusing. Some people like it. So there you go. Don't shoot the messenger. Another method that you had for the exact same thing to recall verb tenses is this one just a dot. A dot on the left means the past, a dot on the right means the future, okay? If you're going to use dots, I do urge you to make very big dots so they don't get lost on the page, okay? It's much more economic, but it has the pitfall of it could not be visible. So make sure that you make your dots visible. Saw and will see, okay? Another thing that I've seen students do, let me change the color once again, I've seen students also do this. They integrate the line with the symbol they're creating. That way they don't have to pick up, oh, actually, let me do that one again. They integrate the line with the, with the uh, symbol they're creating or with the abbreviation itself, because we can also use these for abbreviations. So this would be saw, and this would be will see. So they just put a little line. You can even do an arrow if you want or without the arrow. This would be saw and this would be will see, okay? That's another method I've seen my students do. And then finally, I'm gonna draw the other method down here. I hope everyone can see it. Some students use the ending of words to indicate to themselves. So for example, a D would indicate the past and it doesn't matter if the verb is regular or irregular. So it's not sawed, right? But we know that a D means the past because in many regular verbs, ED is the past. This would be the future, we'll see. Okay, so saw and will see with the endings of words. And finally, what I was talking about, the squiggly line is this for ing. Okay, this little curve line at the bottom for ing. So again, look at all the methods we have. This is my favorite because it allows me to just do it simply and not get lost. And I know that if it's a curved line, it, it's, mean, it's meaning uh, verb tenses, but I want you guys to pick one to pick whatever works for you and stick with it. Don't try to do combinations of systems. One system will do, okay? So if you're learning this uh, verb tense method, I want you to, I want it to become automatic. And how does it become automatic? Through repeated practices. So you do dictations 12 to 14 on pages 23 to 24. Another technique that you're going to find in the manual are negatives and opposites. So when you draw one single diagonal line, it tells you that you're either doing a negative or you're doing an opposite. So if we use the heart for love, the heart with a slash is to hate. Again, everybody's eyes should be up here. I'm going to read the message and I want you to follow along. So here we go. I hate buying furniture. We saw sofas, tables, beds, and chairs. I didn't think furniture was so expensive. I'm never going to the mall again, okay? So I want you guys to use the chat and I want you to tell me when you are identifying in this message here, when you identify either negatives or opposites. Go ahead and use the chat and tell me where you see the use of negatives or opposites. Oh, let me open up my chat, okay. 
hate, very good, Luis. When I said I hate, I did this, negative. I don't think, I did this, I don't think. I'm never going to the mall again. All I did was cross out mall, okay? So look at this. I am never going to the mall again. All I did was write the word mall and cross it out. That's the principle of negatives and opposites. So it can be uh, either the complete opposite of a, of, a, of a word, or it can just be don't, didn't, does not, will not, things like that. I do urge you to just write down one slash instead of, I see some of my students doing X's. The more traces you can save yourself, the less you're writing, the more you're listening, the more you're open to absorbing that information. So again, negatives and opposites, you draw a diagonal line over the word or the symbol to indicate the opposite meaning. For this to become automatic, you're going to do dictation 15 on page 25. Emphasis. When people speak and they repeat things or they emphasize things, we can underline them. So in this case, the person said, I really hate watching TV. And the cool thing about emphasis, and I neglected to say also negatives and opposites, is that you don't even have to wait for the person to finish talking. You can already go ahead and start doing your, um, your line. So for example, if the person says, I don't see him. Did you notice that as soon as I heard the word don't, I made my slash? I didn't wait for the verb. I don't see him. First I made my slash and then I waited for what was coming and then I filled it in. Okay. Same thing happens with emphasis. If the person says, I really, really, really love my son. I don't have to wait for the person to tell me what they really, really, really what. As soon as I hear really, 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 very, 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 all these words that are emphasizing, I draw one underline for each one of those. Okay? So underlining helps me know that emphasis, and that's a very, very important thing. Okay? All right. Let's go back. And that's done when the person repeats or when they emphasize. Okay? Okay, now we're going to talk about abbreviations, which are very important. Not every single word can be written down with symbols. So abbreviations are really cool because they let you take out a word and find the smoothest way, the shortest way to note it down so you can remember it. So the way that Jean-Francois Rosan and Andrew Gillis suggest is that you write down the prefix of the word, the first or the first few letters of the word. You usually omit the middle vowels and then you superscript the suffix, the ending of the word. So let's look at, for example, at the suffix eyes. The typical way many, many words end is with eyes. Instead of writing eyes, we just write a Z and we superscript it. We write it a little higher. So monopolize would become M-O-N-P and we superscript the Z, which will become eyes. Same thing with scrutinize. Same thing with sympathize, okay? So I want you guys to use the chat and tell me how you would use this technique for the word generalize. How would you abbreviate the word generalize? You see, ooh, we got some nice people. Good job, you guys, excellent, very good. So G-E-N and then you superscripted the Z. You don't need anything more than that, okay? Just G-E-N would probably do the trick. Um, how about this word? Um, indoctrinize. Go ahead and use the chat and tell me what you would do with the word indoctrinize. Very good. Just indoc and then a Z. Good job, you guys. You got the point. That's how it works, okay? And you're trying to omit the middle vowels, okay? You're just trying to put enough in the page to prompt your memory, okay? Another very common suffix is words that end in yun. It can be shun with a double S, or it can be shun with a T-I-O-N, or it can be shun with an S. So there's different ways, as long as it ends in that I-O-N, okay? So when you have a word like institution, you would take those first few letters, I-N-S-T, and you would superscript just the letter N. And the letter N stands for shun. Same thing with constitution. We're just saying C-O-N-S-T-N. And same thing with probation, okay? Just the superscripted 
N tells me what it is. But here's the kicker. You have to pay attention. Because if you don't pay attention, then this could be construction. Constitution can be construction. So if you're not paying attention, it's going to throw you off. But if you are paying attention, if you are listening, if you're writing very little, you can really absorb the message and you're going to remember it so it'll fill in the blanks. You will be able to fill in the blanks, okay? Yes, Jesus, it's all about context, okay? So constitution and construction are very different things. You probably don't confuse them once you've heard the full message, okay? The next one is I've, I-V-E. And the only thing you're going to do with that is the letter V, superscripting the letter V. So executive would be abbreviated like this, superscripted V, exclusive like this, again, superscripted V, and the same superscripted V with reclusive, okay? Words that end in itty would have the superscripted Y, okay? And again, omitting as many letters in the middle as you can, so you can go ahead and fill in those gaps. And the words that end in meant, you superscript the letter T. The words that end in a bowl, you superscript the letter B. And this has to become automatic. So the way for this to become automatic is through dictations. Doing dictation 16 and 17 on page 28 repeatedly until you know this by heart, until it flows out of your fingertips, okay? Now let's talk about note-taking symbols. This is one of the juiciest things that uh, we can get into, note-taking symbols. Now, most important thing to remember is that most symbols for note-taking are based on meaning, okay? So they're not going to be based on sound. They're going to be based on the concept of, of the meaning of a word, okay? Many symbols also have multiple meanings. So if we look at the heart, I want you guys to use the chat and tell me what different uses, what different meanings can be represented by that heart. Good job, you guys. Like, love, desire, want, need, well, need, I wouldn't use it. Cardiac heart. Very good. Now, so if something has multiple meanings, we want, in some contexts, prefer, very good, wish, desire, very good. So we can get different meanings out of one same symbol, so we have to pay attention. But because we're trying to get different meanings out of one same symbol, we want to think of it as an umbrella. We don't want to stretch that umbrella out too much. We want things to fit nicely under that umbrella. So for example, this is a symbol that I use, the exclamation mark, I use it for think. But I also, so thinks falls right under that umbrella. But other things like idea, understand, believe, realize. Look at the word figure out. Figure out is a little bit out of that umbrella, but it's still in within that umbrella. The word comprehend falls nicely, neatly under that umbrella. But if I try to make this symbol also mean excitement, or if I try to make the symbol of the exclamation mark also stand for sexy, I'm way out of the umbrella. So because a um, symbol can have different meanings, we don't want to stretch it out too much because then it won't prompt our memory. So again, if we're talking about the heart, we might want it to mean want and love and feelings, but we might not want it to mean health. If you already have it for that, that's perfect. Don't try to reinvent the wheel now. But if you're learning the meanings to a symbol, try to keep it nice and compact. So when you see that symbol, it's easy for your mind to fill in those gaps, okay? Remember that symbols for note-taking for interpreters are unique to each interpreter. So if you study the manual and you realize, you know what, I already have a symbol for that, don't try to relearn that symbol for, a new me for that same meaning, that new symbol for that same meaning that you have with another symbol. Keep things, if they're automatic to you, keep them. And just say, I'm ignoring you, Virginia, I already have a symbol for that, okay? They're unique to you and they should work for you. Or if I'm suggesting a symbol that when you try it, it just simply doesn't evoke that. Some people don't like the exclamation mark for think. Some of my students simply don't like it. So I want you to think of something else. I want you to come up with another symbol for that. It should work for you and not the way around, okay? So let me give you guys some alternatives for the word think because I have seen my students complain about that. They don't like, again, this is my think. This is how I write think, an exclamation mark. And it comes out of the fact that in some cartoons, you'll see when somebody's thinking, the little thought bubble comes up and there's an exclamation mark in there. But 
I have also seen this and a lot of people like this. This is think like a little face, right? But the Picasso version of a face and then an undulating line think the word no which is a little more certain is a straight line so this would be to know and this would be to think okay whatever you're going to do make sure it works for you it should be evoking that meaning for you so again if if me if if i suggest things that don't work for you or if another teacher is suggesting something that doesn't work for you i want you to find what works for you or to stick with what you already know. That's the most important thing that when you see it on your page, it evokes that for you. Another important thing to remember for symbols is that they should be easy to draw. For example, this symbol for me means beginning and this symbol means end. Again, if we have the philosophy of each symbol means several things, what else can this symbol mean? Go ahead and use the chat for this symbol. What else would this beginning symbol mean other than begin? What other falls under the umbrella? Let's see, we have initially start. Very good, from then on. Good job, you guys. At the beginning, okay, good work. How do you keep, um, somebody made a, a question, Ambrosia, how do you keep subject pronouns straight? Who said what? Subject pronouns are very important and um, I like to have symbols for uh, subject pronouns. Um, so when you say things like, for example, let me clear the screen. This would be I for me. This would be you. This would be she. Remember, this is the symbol for a woman. I have made it a little simpler like this. I omitted the horizontal line. So I, you, she, he. For we, I just write we because it's short enough. And for them, I write, write this, M, or for they, okay? So this is, I do like to take note of pronouns because it's, it's important to keep your facts straight. But again, if somebody is speaking and they're saying, um, they're saying something like, I went to the store and I bought apples and I went to the supermarket and I bought this and I, 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 you don't need to write that I because everything the person is saying belongs to I. But if the person is jumping all over the place, I went to the store and my husband told me that I should buy sneakers and she said that I shouldn't buy that and we think then you should be getting your pronouns down so you can know exactly who said what, okay? So if it's, if it's repetitive and it's the same thing, don't worry about it. If the person's jumping all over the place, make sure you do get that. Okay, um, and the symbol for people, I actually tend to write the same symbol for people, but for some reason I don't confuse it. It's like supposed to be a, 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 a full body, okay? You use the Chinese character for people or person, Jackie? Oh, at the end, I want Jackie to show us what she means by the Chinese character. That's interesting. Okay, you guys, let's go back and look at our presentation. So again, oh, actually I forgot to make this point. So symbols should be easy to draw. So um, for example, this is one of the most complicated symbols which is open the door or open. I used to draw it like this, but one of my students, one of my brilliant students, I always learn so much from you guys, taught me that she basically omits that last line. Anytime you can save yourself a trace, that's even better. For example, the, the symbol for male is this, but if you draw it with a curved line, it tends to be quicker. Or when you're drawing a heart, don't get too perfectionistic. Some of my students feel like this heart is hard for them, so they end up doing things like this. That's fine. As long as when you look at it, you know what you meant to say, okay? You shouldn't have symbols that are too complicated. So if, for example, this is your eye, this should be your eye. But if you've decided that your eye is supposed to look like this, and you wanna draw the eyelashes and everything, and you wanna make sure you don't forget the eyebrow, then this is gonna be way too complicated and you're not gonna be able to keep up. So you want your symbols to be very, very simple. Okay. All right. Very good. So let's go back to the presentation. Okay. We need symbols to be simple. Now, this is the most important thing I can share with you guys tonight. For you to learn your symbols, 
everything you need to learn your symbols is on page 35, okay? Everything you need to get those symbols to become automatic to you, to get them pouring out of your fingers, to look at them on the page and know exactly what you meant is on page 35 of your manual. So a little mnemotechnia. If you ever forget what page did Virginia say, I want you to remember that you do an okay sign and you do a high five, okay? Page 35, okay? So everything you need to know is on page 35. That's going to allow you to follow the sequence very nicely. So let's take a look at page 35. Now, this is page 35 in your manual. And if you notice, I give you a study sequence here. The first thing, can everyone see this? Now? Now? Oh, wait, wait. Silly me, I haven't shared it with you guys. How are you going to be able to see it? You see? Sometimes your teacher's not so smart. Okay, good. Can everybody see it now? Okay, excellent. So, now. We're looking at, um, first, before we even go into the cycles, which are down here, I'm going to talk about the study sequence, okay? Because this is the same sequence you're going to be going over and over again, okay? For this, you're going to be um, using um, post-it notes, or you're going to be using index cards, or if you don't have either and you just wanna use regular paper, just cut up your paper into this type of size, okay? And the first phase is to get to know the symbols. If you don't remember how that's done, it's page 30 to 31, but I'm going to give it to you here. In the first phase, you're going to take each one of those symbols that belongs to that cycle, and you're going to create study cards for them. Now. If you will notice, a cycle is composed of five symbols. We're tackling five symbols at a time. Again, we want it to become automatic. We don't want you to be thinking, how do I write this? How do I write that? Or when you're reading it, what did I mean by that? We don't want that. We want automaticity. And how does something become a habit? Through repetition. So to tackle these symbols, we have divided them up into five, into groups of five. Every group of five is going to go through these four phases, and you're just going to repeat these phases, okay? The first phase is, again, everything you need is on page 35. The first phase, you're just going to say, okay, what are the symbols in cycle number one? Okay, the symbols in cycle number one are speak. Okay, so this is the first card. The second symbol in that cycle is need. So this is my second card. The third symbol in this cycle is work. And this is my third card. The fourth one is think. And for those of you who don't like the exclamation mark, you can do the little baseball looking one. Think. And my last symbol is going to be want. Okay? So that's the front of the card. Okay? Now, the back of this card, you're going to put different meanings to it. And I do want you to, I actually, I'm writing it in marker because I want it to be visible for you guys, but I want you using pen. I want you to use something that doesn't bleed through the page, that doesn't bleed through the paper so you can't see it from the other side. Okay. So which, um, somebody's asking who, uh, who wants the, the manual will send you that information to get the info. We'll send you the link to purchase the manual. And that comes with a link with the audio link. So we'll send you that information for you to purchase the manual if you don't have it. So what would we write here on the back of this card? Go ahead and use the chat and tell me what we would write on the back of this card. Very good. Love, like, want. Okay. This is what we would write on the back of that card. Okay. Now, what about this yes, card? Can't you can't see me? Okay, let me stop the share. Okay. What would you guys write on the back of this card? Think. Very good. What else? Think, believe. There's a very good question from Mari. Mari's asking if we write it down in both languages. No, you only need to write it down in one language. Because if you are working with a concept, it doesn't matter if the person says pensar or if the person says think. It's the concept that matters, okay? So what we want you to do is we want you to memorize this concept, okay? So realize, idea, believe, 
all of these words, you're going to write them down in the back. You're going to take a pen and you're going to write all of these words in the back. Okay, think, believe, and all that good stuff. Okay, how about this guy? Oh, this one we already saw. Okay, same thing goes for this one. What would you guys write on the back of this card? Understand on for the previous work. Very good. What else? What else other than work? Job, gig. Ooh, good job, gig, Carla. Employment. Good job. Good job, Jesus. Employment. What else? Employee might be stretching that umbrella a little bit much. How about um, a type of law? Starts with an L. Labor, good job, Mari. Labor, job, gig, employment, all of those things are going to go in the back of this card. And you will go and do that same thing with all of the cards in that cycle, okay? And once you have finished all of the cards in that cycle, you're going to drill them. And you're going to drill them like this. This is phase number two, drilling the symbols. And if you want a refresher on page 31 to 32, I refresh your memory on how to do that. So basically you're going to refresh, you're going to drill them like this. You make sure all the cards have the symbol facing you. And then you go through the cards and you call out the symbol as so. Think, want, work, need, say. And you're going to do it timing yourself. So each time you're going to go faster, you're trying to attempt a shorter, timing and then you're going to take your cards and you're going to shuffle your cards and then you're going to go through your cards again each time calling out only one symbol i don't want you to say say declare state speak talk love what no i want you to say the most obvious meaning and move on to the next one because what we want is speed we want to train your brain to be able to look at that symbol and immediately evoke the meaning Okay, so that's the first activity. You do it until you can no longer beat your own score and you write your record, you write your timing, you take your actually use your phone, your smartphone or a timer or a watch, anything that indicates the seconds and you write down your times and you try to do it faster each time. Okay, so that's phase number two. Phase number three, you're going to use those symbols with dictations. And if you don't remember how that's done in pages 33 to 34, I refresh your memory on that. So basically what you're going to do is if you notice here in cycle number one, I'm telling you which pages that is on and which are the tracks. So you would get ready with your pen and your notepad and you would play track 18. And as you're playing track 18, what are you doing? You're taking notes, very good. So you're listening and you're taking notes. Those are the dictations, okay? What do you do after you finish taking notes? What is the next step once you've taken notes and your dictation is track 18 is done? What do you do with your note voice recording? I'm sorry, what do you do with your notes? Very good, you voice record, I gave you guys that one. Okay, so then you took notes, then you take your notes and you read them out loud into the voice recorder. Okay, and then what do you do with that voice recorder you created? You listen to it as you're reading the text. And which text? On pages 36 to 41 is the typed out dictation. So you're going to listen as you compare it to these pages. And then you move on to track 18. And you do the same thing. You do the full dictation. You listen as you take notes, you voice record, and then you hear and compare it to the text. So let's say we finish cycle number one, okay? We would move on to cycle number two. In cycle number two, these are the five symbols we're working with in cycle number two. Which are the, 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 the tracks? Which tracks would we use for cycle number two? Who can use the chat to let me know which track, which audio track? which is the first audio track for cycle number two. Very good. Track 24 to 29 are the, what you're going to be listening to. And then when you're taking notes and you render it into your voice recorder, when you hear yourself, you compare what you said to, the, to what's on these pages. So let's look at that page. Let's look at the page 36. The first dictation is very simple. This is the dictation. So you would hear what you recorded and you compare it to this. You could also look at what I wrote. I always give you my possible notes. Then you move on to the next dictation, page 37. You would listen to what you recorded and then you would compare it to this text over here. And that's how you know if you got something right, if you got something wrong. And you can also look at my possible notes. 
okay? Then we move on to page 37. And as you can see, the dictations get harder and harder. They get progressively harder as, you, as, we, as we move on, okay? So you listen to what you recorded and you compare it to the typed out text. And you stop and you take note. Oh, I omitted such word. Oh, I changed such word. Oh, I said this wrong, okay? And you do the same dictation until you get it until you get it super smooth, until you get it perfect. And again, you can look at the notes that I'm suggesting. I'm always going to give you the notes that I'm suggesting. So again, which page is the secret magic page that will give you everything you need? 35, 35, very good. In page 35, these are the faces you're going to be doing, creating your cards. Every time you move on to a new cycle, do it cumulatively, cumulatively. Oh my goodness, I'm not very good with that word. Do it with the previous cards you created too. So if you're in cycle two, you should have 10 cards. By the time you get to cycle three, if you feel like, you know what, I already know these cards, let me just focus on these that are still giving me trouble. So go ahead and practice your full stash of cards that are still giving you difficulty for phase number one, okay? So you create your cards, that's phase number one. You drill the symbols, time-limited activities. Then you do your dictations, and the, each cycle will tell you the pages and the tracks, and then you grade your performance by listening to yourself and comparing it, okay? That's the whole deal. That is the way to master these symbols. And again, you do it repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly until you know it by heart, okay? So page 35 is the way to go. Now, I do want to urge you guys to study with someone. I want you guys to find somebody to study with. You can study with someone on FaceTime. You can study with someone over the phone. You can study with someone in person, actually meet with a person. You can st study with someone on Skype or on Zoom. But there are many ways technology allows us to meet with people and to, and to, and to have a study buddy. A study buddy will increase your motivation. It's been proven time and time again. If you have somebody to study with, you will be motivated. A study buddy will give you new input. You can learn a lot by exchanging ideas, seeing the way people take down notes, seeing what works for them. And I wanna talk about some additional educational tools for those of you who want to get to the next level. We're going to be offering a consecutive interpretation bootcamp level one. It's going to be offered on September the 6th, the 13th, the 20th, and the 27th. It's going to be from 5.30 till 7 p.m. We do have relatively small groups, so if you want to sign up, please let us know as soon as possible because we, um, we don't keep it open-ended, so enrollment is going to be time-limited. And we meet on Zoom, this same platform. But the beautiful thing is that because it's a smaller group, much smaller group, you're able to interact with the students and with the teacher. The great thing about it is you can take the class from home, so you can be in your pajamas if you want to. As long as you're decent from the waist up, we don't care what you're wearing. You get all the perks of being in a class, but you don't have to commute. You get to interact with your classmates and with your teacher in real time. You get to ask any question that you have and you get to have your answers, your questions answered immediately. Being part of a group increases your motivation, increases your commitment. You know, sometimes we're a little tired at the end of the day and we say, oh, I'm not going to study today. But knowing that you have a group that you have to meet, that you have to show up really makes you uh, stay the course. You can learn a lot of cool tips from your classmates. Every time I teach this workshop, I learn something new. My students are always teaching me cool things. You get personalized feedback. Every time we have an assignment, I'm going to give you feedback that is tailored and specific to your progress and to uh, your particular notes. So I'm going to help you tweak those um, difficulties that you may have and also enhance the things that you're doing well. This Zoom course will help you get to those hard to reach places. And again, uh, we're going to be offering it on September 6th to 27th. We meet uh, from 5.30 to 7 Pacific Standard Time. We also have continuing education courses. Check out our uh, website, which is uh, www.interpretrain.com. And also check us out on Facebook. We're always offering uh, cool tools. And I want to congratulate everybody for completing this workshop. And I want to go ahead and open it up to questions. First, um, we had Jackie. And Jackie was going to show us um, the symbols that she uses, um, which was a symbol that she says she used for people. Okay, let's see. 
Um, is Jackie there? I don't know if Jackie's still there. She might have left. Okay, so we're going to open it up for questions. If anybody has any questions, uh, go ahead and let us know. Um, oh, it, Jackie says it looks like my house symbol. Oh, so let me share with you guys my house symbol. This is my house symbol. Let me clear this. This is my house symbol. So this is people. This is the people that Jackie uses. Is that right? Okay, cool. Excellent. Okay, so we will be sending you the information for those of you who want to buy the manual. Um, don't forget that once you get your manual, it includes that, that link for the free audio. Um, we uh, also will be um, sending you guys the information to the boot camp. Um, I know you will enjoy the boot camp and get a lot out of it. We have a question here. I purchased the book on Amazon, but I don't have the audio. Okay, the audio again is, uh, let me give you the link. I want you to copy it. Go ahead and copy this link and um, you can use the link to get those free audios. If you want to have the CD, you can purchase it, of course, but you can get the free audio um, with these. Um, when, where will these notes be available? Um, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by where the notes will be available. Every th single thing that you need is already contained in your manual, okay? And for those of you who don't have the uh, link included in the manual, again, go ahead and copy this link that I, go ahead and just step on your, you know, put your cursor on your, uh, on your chat and copy that. And then anytime you put it um, in your search, it'll take you there. Okay. Um, any tips on not letting your notes spill to the center line? Um, I mean, I wouldn't worry about it too much uh, if, if it spills over a little bit. The only thing that I would say is that if you notice that you've reached the center line and you still want to give further ideas, you just keep going down. So for example, let's say you're writing here and the person said, I went to the zoo and they were giraffes and uh, elephants and the elephant was fat and beautiful and big and even though that person is still describing the elephant because I have reached this middle line I'm still going down by not going out to the left I will know that I'm still talking about the elephant but don't cross that line because that's what allows you to get vertical and when you get vertical you can use the recall line and you can get uh, you can scan your notes easier and you can use the shifting technique okay um, are there certain contexts or jobs which do not use notes for consec? I always take notes. I always take notes. I find that um, taking notes is, uh, is a way to be very precise. Um, I'm always a, a little bit um, surprised by how both doctors and lawyers and judges are so grateful that I am I try to be very faithful to the original meaning. I believe that the only way you can do an accurate interpretation is by conveying every single um and oh the person is giving you. A good clinician wants to hear if their patient is hesitant. A good lawyer wants to hear if, if their client, if a witness is, is, is sure of themselves or not. So I find that notes are the best way for you to render uh, the message accurately and faithfully. Okay, so I would say yes, always take notes. Um, and you guys, thank you so much for joining us. We're so, so happy that you were able to join us. We do hope to um, see you guys in the boot camp. Um, just make sure you keep studying. Even if you don't join us for the boot camp, this manual is everything you need. Just stick to page 35, okay? Remember what is like that? 35. Keep working, keep working, and repeat things. Repeat them. Repetition is the key to mastery, okay? So I want you guys to give yourselves a round of applause. Yay! You guys have been an awesome class. Thank you so much for joining us. You can always reach us um, in uh, through our um, Facebook. Do check out our Facebook page. You can also email us at info at interpret train. And uh, we hope you get a, you got a lot out of this course. And uh, keep at it. Keep at it. And I and, and I promise you, you'll see progress. Okay. Good night, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you so much for joining us.
Good night.